Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that may not be suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Today, April 22nd, 2018, marks the 54th anniversary of one of the most infamous murders in the history of Nashville. Paula Herring's murder became a legend, known as the babysitter murder. For years, people warned youngsters to lock the doors or you'll end up like Paula Herring. If it happened today, her case would still probably be headline news, as we always tend to sensationalize the murders of pretty blonde girls. But Paula's story also made a big splash at the time because Nashville's metro government was only a year old. There was intense pressure to solve this one fast. And solve it fast they did. In a five-day trial, about six months later. So Paula Herring was relegated to urban legend, a pretty face that pops up if you Google famous Nashville murders. Then in 1997, a man named Michael Bishop volunteered to help a friend catalog major crimes of Nashville over the past hundred years. He came across Paula Herring's file. There were graphic black and white photos, letters, and telegrams to the chief of police. One letter was from Nashville's first Metro mayor, Beverly Briley tucked in among the evidence, seemingly giving his whereabouts for the night of Paula's murder. This letter, along with a telegram from none other than J. Edgar Hoover, sent Mr. Bishop on a 20-year odyssey, trying to find out why so many high-ranking officials were involved in this case. And in doing so, he uncovered the truth behind Paula Herring's murder and why it was covered up. Welcome to Episode 14, The Babysitter Murder. Scandal in Music City. In February of 1964, 18-year-old Paula Herring was a blossoming freshman at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. She had been rushed for a sorority and was starting to see a boy steady. Gone was the mousy brown hair and clunky eyeglasses. Now Paula was a pretty athletic blonde, standing five feet five inches tall. Years of basketball had conditioned her into a strong but graceful young woman. Ditching her glasses for contacts and lightening her hair to blonde had transformed the young woman, but so had leaving home. The loss of her father three years earlier had been rough. She was a daddy's girl. It would always hurt. But Paula's mother, Jo, seemed to be handling her grief differently. A nurse at Vanderbilt Hospital, she lost no time assembling an array of boyfriends to spend her time with. She left Paula's six-year-old brother, Alan, home alone a lot. Friends and neighbors felt sorry for the boy. For some reason, instead of going skiing with her girlfriends, Paula was flying back to Nashville to visit with her family. It was crummy Nashville weather with temperatures in the 20s but it was the biggest snow of the year on the slopes. So why would Paula, with a new boyfriend, new sorority friends, and an invitation to go ski, go to Nashville instead? Was it for Alan? It wasn't a holiday. Joe said it was just a normal family visit. And yet she didn't even pick Paula up at the airport. Paula had to take a taxi to a neighbor's house. Then Joe stayed out drinking with her friends, bringing them back late with her that evening to continue the party at the house. The next day was Saturday, and Paula had made plans to attend a basketball game at her old alma mater, Overton High School. She was looking forward to not only seeing old friends and teammates, but debuting her new look. Joe would later claim that Paula had insisted on babysitting Alan so she could go on a dinner date with friends. She and her work friend Lizzie had dates. She later told the police and the press that her daughter was home reading the book All the King's Men for a book report. Late that evening, around 11 o'clock, Joe came back to the house with the two men named A.J. Meadows and Billy Vanderpool. All three walked in and found Paula in the den, face down in front of the TV. She was lying in a pool of her own blood, her white blouse stained crimson. Her face was pale and battered. She had been beaten and strangled, but cause of death would be gunshots fired into her back going straight through her heart. Her skirt was pulled up and one leg was hooked around the leg of the TV stand. 
Billy Vanderpool called the police department while Joe checked for a pulse. A.J. Meadows got sick and ran for his car, leaving the scene. Paula's six-year-old brother, Alan, was in a nearby room and had apparently slept through the attack. He came out of the room when he heard everyone, quaking with fear, and said he had gone to bed earlier in the evening, but came out when he heard the phone ringing. He saw his sister lying on the floor, but he couldn't wake her up. He said he thought she had spilled some tomato juice, and he went back to bed after that. The murder hit the front page of the Tennessean the next morning, and the community was in an uproar. The Herrings lived on Timber Hill Drive in the Creve Hill area, a fairly new subdivision southeast of downtown Nashville. The neighborhood was already on high alert. There had been a few rapes and reports of a prowler in the Creve Hall area in the last few months. They thought he'd finally killed someone. The paper came out on Sunday morning. By Monday evening, they had a suspect. By Thursday evening, Mayor Beverly Briley broke into regularly scheduled programming to alert Nashvilleians to watch the nightly news for an announcement. He told viewers, quote, We know who's guilty of this crime. We are certain. The man is under surveillance, and he's not under arrest, but we know what's going on. He went on television to announce this before they had even arrested the suspect. He could have waited. Just an hour later, the chief of police received a telegram from the FBI concerning physical evidence. The mayor, the DA, the chief, and all detectives met to consider what they had on their suspect. And they thought they had enough. By Friday morning, they served a first-degree murder warrant to a man named John Clark. If you think all of this happened quickly, you're right. But this investigation lasted only a day longer than the actual criminal trial. Every high-ranking official in Metro Nashville wanted this case closed, and quickly. It would be over 50 years before anyone understood why. At this point in the story, I'd like to tell you a bit about Michael Bishop. He's the author of the book A Murder in Music City, Corruption, Scandal, and the Framing of an Innocent Man. He blew the lid off the Paula Herring murder last year when he published the book. Mr. Bishop was born in Gadsden, Alabama, and grew up on a small farm on Sand Mountain. He is a graduate of Freed Hardman University and earned his master's degree from UT Knoxville, the same school that Paula Herring was attending when she was murdered. He worked in academic health systems with hospitals all over the country. Over lunch with a friend in Sylvan Park, he became interested in historical crimes and mysteries of Nashville. His friend Clayton had started a project cataloging these interesting cases. Some really famous ones, like the search for country music star Jim Reeves after his plane disappeared south of the city, and the murder of Hee Haw's string bean Aikman and his wife. Mr. Bishop was intrigued. He offered to help his friend. He was experienced in research from grad school at UT but he wound up in more of a sales position in the healthcare industry following the tech boom in the 80s. But like many research junkies, his friend's tales of old Nashville got him itching to dig back into a project. He left lunch that day and went straight to the Metro Police archives. A couple of days later, he happened to be there when a bunch of boxes were brought in that were from the office of former police chief Hubert Kemp. The clerk on duty told him he was welcome to look through the boxes, even though they hadn't been cataloged yet. She explained they were from the 1960s, and to me, they sound kind of boring. Timesheets, training logs, complaints. But Mr. Bishop decided to dig through them anyway. Since they hadn't been archived, he would be the first to look at them since the 60s. He found a manila folder that was marked Paula Herring and was shocked to discover it seemed to be part of the original case file. It had crime scene and morgue photos, witness statements, letters and telegrams to the chief, and his personal notes on the case. He was struck looking at Paula's pitiful body. It was a brutal murder. She'd fought hard for her life. People remember that she was shot to death. I'm not so sure they knew the extent of her injuries. She was beaten and strangled, had multiple contusions, and three gunshot wounds. Most reports will say two shots. In fact, that's all that was mentioned in court. Mike Bishop was galvanized. 
especially once he found a letter from Mayor Beverly Briley in the file. He seemed to be answering a letter from a concerned citizen who feared the Creve Hall prowler was Paula's murderer and must have felt the police response was lacking. In the letter, Mayor Briley used the word metropolitan five times, and he specifically seems to be chastising whomever he is writing to about calling the correct authorities. Listen to the tone of this sentence. Quote, for your information, the police department has been hampered in its activities in that area because many of the residents who have reported incidents called a nearby fire department of the office of the district attorney rather than notify the Metropolitan Police. Since the Metropolitan Police Department is considered the local law enforcement agency, calls of this nature should be referred directly to them. If that sounds a bit snippy and defensive to you, you're right, and there's some juicy background behind it. Beverly Briley was the first mayor of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville in Davidson County. After World War II, Nashville had experienced a suburban boom. The county and city had separate police forces, health departments, school systems, and of course taxes. The problem was, county residents often took advantage of city amenities without paying the city taxes. But the county couldn't even afford its own sewage system or fire department. Aside from obvious money issues, keeping the court systems, law enforcement, and emergency services separate was becoming more and more difficult for Nashville and Davidson County. The agencies were just spread thin. Beverly Briley was a county judge, and along with Nashville Mayor Ben West, with the support of both local newspapers, the Tennessean and the Nashville Banner, they sponsored a charter to consolidate the two governments in 1958. But Nashville citizens voted against the charter. They didn't want taxes raised, and they were resisting many expansion plans. But the city enacted a new will tax that affected county and city residents, as county citizens who used city roads would have to comply. The city also began annexing large tracts of land in the county for commercial and residential property. That changed their minds. A second charter was drawn up. But this time, Mayor Ben West and the Nashville Banner were not in support. The annexation they were attempting would have better served their political control. The Nashville Banner is now a defunct daily newspaper that was long a voice of conservative viewpoints, often in stark contrast to its liberal counterpoint, the Tennessean. Naturally, the Tennessean backed Beverly Briley, and they launched a massive campaign for passage of the Charter. Briley was a gifted politician, and not only effectively got city and county residents to vote for the consolidation, he beat Mayor Ben West to become the first Metro Nashville mayor. The new metropolitan government was implemented on April Fool's Day, 1963, with the mayor and the new council being sworn in on the same day. Nashville was actually the first city in the country to achieve a fully consolidated government. All later successful metropolitan cities modeled their formation on Nashville. Back to that letter that was found in the chief's files, it's pretty clear from the content and the tone that the new metro agencies were having some difficulties. I'm sure once Mayor West and Judge Briley parted ways, the political lines were drawn on this issue. So now, with a new government and a new mayor, folks who should be calling metro were still calling their city or county departments, depending on which way their politics slanted. This resulted in a lot of confusion and slower response times, the exact thing consolidation was meant to alleviate. Obviously, since Nashville became a pioneer for metropolitan cities, they eventually were able to work out these issues. But in the early days, Mayor Briley was battling this political divide and trying to prove his new government was working. So in context, that letter makes more sense. At least the snippy part I just read. The part of the letter that sent Mike Bishop down a 20-year rabbit hole investigating this case was when Mayor Briley placed himself in the Creve Hall area on the night of the murder. He said he was leaving a house in Creve Hall and heard the police report of the shortwave radio in his car. This bit of detail was suspicious. He could have answered the complaint without that part. It's possible he was just fleshing out his opinion on how fast Metro Police were, since by saying he was in the area, he was able to claim that they responded so fast that they were at the Herring House within two minutes. 
That's ridiculously fast, even by 2018 standards. But perhaps what made it so unusual is the fact that the chief of police hung on to this letter for so many years and specifically kept it in the Paula Herring file. Frankly, it sounds like the answer to a complaint, albeit a long-winded answer, but still. Why was it in this file? Let's go back to the timeline now and see how this original case played out. But first, I need to pause to hear a word from our sponsors. The scene at Timber Hill Drive that chilly evening of February 1964 was chaotic. There were many people coming and going, and as we now know, that's not great for an investigation. The detectives talked to Joe Herring and Vanderpool and thought they were both drunk. They also noted that Joe was pretty hysterical and seemed to be in shock. But they were still suspicious enough to take her downtown for questioning. This is a little-known fact in the case that wasn't discovered until Bishop found a photograph of Joe Herring leaving the station at dawn the next morning. It was clearly snapped by a reporter, and yet it didn't appear in the papers. It probably wasn't in the papers for the same reason Joe walked out of that interrogation when she did. Mayor Beverly Briley. Before the break, I talked a bit about Briley's political career. Now we can get to his personal life. First off, he always claimed he was a graduate of Vanderbilt, but the truth is he went to Cumberland School of Law. Seems he started off bending the truth and never really stopped. Married, with two grown children, he was also an alcoholic, a womanizer, and there were whispers of drug use. He often secretly checked into Vanderbilt Hospital to dry out. Guess who he met there? Our girl, Eva Jo Herring and also her friends Lizzie Deverne and Evelyn Johnson. These nurses and the mayor were all actually in a secret and exclusive so-called drinking club. The other members, they were Sheriff Leslie Jett, two Metro detectives, and Assistant District Attorney John Hollins. And where did this club meet? Often in an apartment behind what is now the Zanies Comedy Club. And this wasn't just a drinking club. This was about drugs, medication that the nurses could provide to these high-powered men. This made it much easier to hide what was going on. Can you imagine the mayor or a police officer risking a drug deal in Printer's Alley? They needed Joe Herring and her friends. It isn't clear how many people actually knew that Joe was even interrogated. But a close source to the investigation said that Joe Herring played the mistress card and continuously referred to the book Paula was supposedly reading called All the King's Men. That's right, she said she was the mayor's mistress, and told the men interrogating her to get him on the phone. Here's the other thing. That book was missing from the house. It was found in a ditch a couple of days later. But why would the killer take that book? The answer is, he wouldn't. Furthermore, UT Knoxville confirmed that Paula was not assigned a book report for all the King's men for any of her classes. To me, this is a major red flag, in line with why she came to Nashville in the first place that particular weekend. There was no reason. Like I said before, she had a new boyfriend, invitation to go skiing, new sorority friends. It's true that Paula was looking forward to going to the basketball game at Overton that Saturday night. She'd been team captain. And as I said, not only was she looking forward to catching up with friends, she had a new look to show off. But she wouldn't have flown home just for that game. And then there's the matter of the plane ticket. If she's not coming home for a special reason, why spend the money on a plane ticket? It was around $100. That would be almost $800 today. And Paula didn't get to go to the basketball game. She was disappointed. A friend she was going to meet at the game had offered her a ride, but said that Paula told her she was going to take her mother's car. But Joe took the car that night, despite the fact that Paula had it cleaned that morning so she could take it herself. And her friend had already left for the game before Paula realized she couldn't take the car, so she had no ride. Paula's college friends said that she was as broke as any college freshman would usually be. Joe Herring paid for her plane ticket home. And then, not only chose to hang out with her friends instead of visiting with her daughter, 
also took the car, leaving Paula stranded. And it was not to babysit. She was notorious with her neighbors for leaving six-year-old Alan at home alone. They looked after the poor kid whenever they could. Another close friend of Paula's from UT told Mike Bishop that Paula and her mother did not get along. She said that Paula knew something about her father's death, and she was doing everything she could to get away from her mother. None of this adds up. Why in the world would Joe spring for this plane ticket? If Paula's friend was just gossiping or even exaggerating, and Joe truly did miss her daughter, then why didn't she stay home with her Friday or Saturday night? These are questions I imagine Joe was asked in that six-hour interrogation. I'd love to know what her answers were. In court, and to reporters, she insisted that she and Paula were very close and that Paula was just home for a weekend visit and then volunteered to babysit. All we know now is that she eventually said, call the mayor, and the mayor put pressure on Chief Kemp until he finally released her. Mike Bishop believes the reason she kept saying Paula was reading that particular book, All the King's Men, was because it was a veiled threat to both the mayor and the powerful men she was involved with. As in, you better let me go, or the king and all his men will go down with what I know. It worked. Joe walked out that Saturday morning, and by Monday afternoon, a guy named Al Baker tracked down a buddy of his. He had a story to tell. On Saturday evening, he'd run into an old friend of his at Ruth's diner. They weren't close friends, but they had been drinking buddies. This would be John Randolph Clark, known as Red, for his ginger hair. He said that John Clark had a beer, and then he went to make a phone call. When he returned, he bragged that he'd called Joe Herring's house, hoping to hook up with her for the evening. But instead, her daughter, a UT freshman, had answered the phone. Al claims that John told him that he invited himself over and was going to take a six-pack of beer. He said that if the daughter wasn't interested, he would just wait for Joe to get home. Al Baker claimed that after he read the headlines Sunday morning, he remembered this conversation and his conscience was killing him. He called a buddy with the Metro Police and told them what he knew. Al Baker was a ne'er-do-well from a wealthy family in Green Hills. He didn't really work. He spent his time in pool halls, drinking with buddies. Maybe he did have a conscience. Or maybe he saw the story in the Nashville Banner that the governor, the Metro Council, and the paper had put together a reward for information for $7,480. That was more than a year's salary for most people. Today, it would be almost $60,000. Al Baker doesn't strike me as a man with a conscience, so much as a man who liked easy money. He lived off of his family, but he did have a daughter to support. The policeman asked him if John Clark owned a gun. Mr. Baker helpfully said yes indeed, that Clark owned a thirty two caliber Beretta. This matched the gun used in the murder. That was enough for the chief homicide detective to dispatch officers to go pick up John Clark. Around 6 p.m. Monday evening, he agreed to come in for questioning with his wife Callie following along so she could bring him home later. John Clark was 39 years old, and while he was a drinking philanderer, he also happened to be fairly well-connected himself. His father was a General Sessions judge from East Tennessee and also a Republican floor leader with the state Senate. John's family was prominent, and his siblings had all gone on to distinguished careers in the Air Force, education, and even the CIA. Obviously the black sheep, John had changed jobs five times in the last five years and he'd been mostly unemployed for the last 18 months. His wife worked as a school teacher to support them. The police interrogated him, sometimes with as many as 15 officers in the room for the entire night without food, drink, or his medication that he asked for. They wouldn't even let him use the restroom. Naturally, as a judge's son, when they asked him to take tests, he refused. Fingernail scrapings, paraffin testing to check for gunpowder, and of course, he definitely wasn't taking a polygraph. He did, however, let them do a full body search, and they did not find one single scratch, bruise, or anything that would indicate he might have been involved in a physical attack. Remember, Paula had extensive cuts, scratches, and bruises. She'd also fought back, and some tissue was found under her nails, but obviously in 1964, there was no DNA testing. 
Clark also told them he owned a gun, a 32 caliber, but that it had been stolen or lost 10 days earlier. He volunteered the information that it was a dark suit he had dropped off at the dry cleaners. They sent officers over immediately to get the suit. Keep in mind, he admitted all of this willingly. If he had the presence of mind to refuse all the tests, then he probably could have kept these details to himself. But John Clark was many things. Maybe he wasn't that smart. Or maybe he wasn't worried because he didn't kill Paula Herring. He never lied about knowing Joe Herring. He never lied about cheating on his wife, about drinking, or anything else. Honestly, he comes off as the most truthful person in this whole debacle. With no physical evidence from John Clark, much less a confession, the police had to let him go. They didn't have the gun and didn't have anything else to go on. A search of Clark's home and a vehicle turned up nothing. Al Baker's buddy called him back on Tuesday and said, We have a problem. We can't find the gun, and there's no physical evidence tying Clark to the scene. Overnight, Al Baker's memory was jogged. He called back and told them another tale about how he and John Clark had attended a Christmas Eve party. Clark had the gun, and Al and his friends were making fun of him, basically saying he didn't have the balls to shoot it. Supposedly, John took the gun out and shot it into some snow near a sidewalk on 18th Avenue. So conveniently, when the police went looking, they dug a shallow hole around where Al Baker pointed out and found a bullet. Along with this discovery, the missing paperback book had been found. A neighbor stumbled upon the book in a ditch. Even though more than 50 officers had fanned out looking for the book for hours the day after the murder. There are so many coincidences happening here. Right after they found the bullet, the police sent it to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation for testing. Just a few hours later, the TBI called back and had the results in. The bullet matched those found at the crime scene. Even better, the police had sent Paula's clothes, along with a suit of John Clark's, which they had taken from his dry cleaner, to the FBI. They also sent the book, All the King's Men. They received a telegram from the FBI just an hour after Mayor Briley went on the news, pronouncing that Metro knew who the killer was. The FBI said fibers found on the suspect's clothing could have come from the victim's clothing. Today, many people vehemently argue that trace evidence such as fibers is junk science. To say it was a slam dunk, even in 1964, would be a stretch. However, civilians were dazzled knowing that the FBI had run the test. In this same telegram, they reported that they found no prints on the book, nor did they find any blood on Clark's suit. I'm wondering about the chain of evidence. I'm wondering about all those items being shipped out together. Mr. Bishop pointed out to me that there was a photograph of a detective on the front page of the Tennessean carrying the evidence, and he was wearing a sweater. Could it have been that simple? Our modern standards of evidence and chain of custody would make this seem impossible. But it's not just that police practices have improved in the last 50 years. Think about the timing of all this. John Clark is picked up on a Monday evening and interrogated until Tuesday evening. So sometime Tuesday or early Wednesday, they retrieved his suit and shipped it with Paula's clothes and book to the FBI, who responded by telegram on Thursday with their results. I understand high-profile cases will get priority, but even today, that timeline is incredible. It makes about as much sense as Mayor Briley claiming that the cops made it to the Herring House two minutes after the call. And, of course, we have no detail of how this evidence was packaged, nor really of how it was even gathered from the scene. Paula's clothes were removed by the medical examiner. Her sweater had been yanked off and was found on the couch with two bullet holes in it. It had been used to muffle the two gunshots in her back. There's not really any record of how all these items were processed, just that they were immediately whisked to the FBI for lab testing. And while the FBI was willing to say the fibers could match, they didn't go any further. The suit had not yet been cleaned, but they found no blood. And even though the book finally turned up, the FBI didn't find one fingerprint on it, not even Paula's. An hour after the mayor went on TV, the FBI's telegram came and the detectives, along with District Attorney Harry Nichol, agreed to swear out a warrant for John Clark's arrest. 
the officers had to go to the hospital to arrest Clark, who had been experiencing blackouts. He already had an attorney, and a good one, named Charles Galbraith. Charles Galbraith publicly proclaimed that, quote, the police department covered up a whole lot of evidence that points away from Clark to another person, and a lot of people in this country are under the protection of the police. On March 13th, a grand jury indicted John Randolph Clark with premeditated murder and murder while attempting to commit the felony of rape. Galbraith was able to get the rape charge dropped in pretrial hearings after the medical examiner's report showed no evidence of rape or seminal fluid. District Attorney Harry Nichol had been pretty vocal on Clark's guilt. He vowed to try the case himself and was going for the death penalty. Clark's attorney was able to get a change of venue, though, and the trial was moved to Jackson, Tennessee. But something happened between all these public promises from Harry Nichol and the trial that was set for September in Jackson. That spring, Sheriff Leslie Jett and several high-ranking officers were indicted in federal court for accepting payoffs from Printer's Alley business owners. Printer's Alley became a nightclub and entertainment district when liquor by the drink sales were illegal in Nashville. But clubs like the Voodoo Lounge, the Rainbow Room, and the Black Poodle, all located in Printer's Alley, served liquor anyway. They claimed any liquor on premises had been brown bagged, which meant that the patron brought it in themselves. This was rarely true. But of course, the police normally looked the other way, mainly because so many politicians frequented the alley's many night spots. It wasn't just the booze. There were strip clubs, gambling halls, and literally all manner of trouble any high-ranking official would not want to be charged with. So it was under this political climate that John Clark's trial was to take place. Suddenly, District Attorney Harry Nichol had no interest in trying this case. He handed it off to his assistant DAs, John Hollins and Howard Butler. If the name John Hollins rings a bell, that's because he was one of the men in Mayor Briley's drinking club, along with Joe Herring, her two friends, two Metro detectives, and a few other high-ranking officers. But of course, no one knew any of this back in 1964. Also, the plan to go for the death penalty? That was dropped, too. John Clark was going to trial charged with first-degree murder with only the possibility of a life sentence. The judge proclaimed that the trial would last exactly five days and that the jury would be sequestered for the duration with no access to news related to the case. This was something that neither the defense or the prosecution objected to. I'm going to tell you right now that this was the one thing out of many bizarre things in this case that I just could not wrap my head around. It didn't seem possible that in a murder trial where there was no weapon or physical evidence or a confession would only go for five days. It's even more unusual for a judge to set that link at the beginning of the trial. I asked Michael Bishop about this. It was the one thing I didn't find explicit in his book. He told me that three people had to agree for this to happen. And then it clicked. The prosecutor, the judge, and the defense attorney were on the same team. He also told me that after John Clark's trial, Charles Galbraith went on to represent Al Baker in another matter before he became a judge on the Circuit Court of Appeals. Yep, the same Al Baker that implicated Clark in the first place. And it's not like Charles Galbraith dumped John Clark after the trial. He worked tirelessly on his appeal for years, and yet at the same time was representing a key witness that put him behind bars. What's more, Charles Galbraith had also slept with Joe Herring. That's right. Both the prosecutor and the defense attorney in the state versus John Randolph Clark had affairs with the star witness, the victim's mother. Over the course of his almost 20-year investigation, Mike Bishop dug up multiple witnesses to corroborate all of these connections. I would love to go into the minute detail of every person Mr. Bishop spoke with, but unfortunately, in an hour-long podcast, that just isn't possible. Mr. Bishop gave me his blessing to cover this case, and generously provided even more background than was in the book. But it's not my place to reveal all of it. It's his. But by the end of today's episode, you will know who was responsible for Paula Herring's death. I will go on and wrap up this farce of a trial for you, but I felt like you needed to know that the game was fixed before we even get going. 
Prosecutor John Hollins opened the trial with his star witness and former lover, Joe Herring. She talked about her life, the struggle of being a widow and raising two children, and her work with Vanderbilt Hospital. Under Holland's questioning, not Galbraith's, Joe Herring admitted on the stand that she had slept with John Clark. At the time, this admission was considered explosive, but in hindsight, I wonder if it wasn't just saved for dramatic effect, or maybe it was actually to lessen the impact, because why else bring it out now? If they could connect their murder suspect to Joe Herring, wouldn't that have been a huge part of the original investigation? And they obviously had known about this already. John Clark admitted during his interrogation that he knew Joe Herring and that he had slept with her once just a couple of weeks before Paula's murder. Again, the man really hid nothing. When Charles Galbraith got up to cross-examine Joe Herring, he exposed the details about her relationship to John Clark. It was basically a one-night stand. Galbraith even asked if they had sex more than once, and she said no. He asked her if it was normal intercourse, and she remarked that it was fair, at which the whole courtroom broke into laughter. Just to recap, Joe had slept with both men questioning her, as well as the man on trial for her daughter's murder. He then moved on to the night of the murder, and Joe went through the same story she had told many times that she came home from work and told her daughter she'd been invited to dinner with some friends and Paula had insisted on babysitting. She said the friends were Lizzie Deverne and two men, A.J. Meadows and Billy Vanderpool. Billy Vanderpool is the one who called the police, and A.J. was the man who ran. Galbraith then put Al Baker on the stand and even got him to admit that he himself had tried to buy John Clark's gun a few days before the murder. Baker had also suggested to mutual friends that he already had the gun and just hadn't paid for it. It's pretty clear that Galbraith was building reasonable doubt by casting a possible suspect with Baker. He also caught him off guard as he left the stand, asking him his whereabouts that night. Baker stuttered around, saying he'd been to a few bars until just after midnight. Of course, there's no real alibi there. Galbraith also went in hard on the investigators, grilling them over the lack of fingerprints that were taken from the scene and other evidentiary issues. But he never brings up that third gunshot wound to Paula's collarbone. That would have been a step too far in the wrong direction. The medical examiner, Dr. W. J. Corr, was up next. He testified that by his estimation the time of death was 9.30. In the doctor's original report, he noted she had been shot three times— once in the front collarbone area and twice in the back. He came off as a kindly older gentleman, but in open court, he said she was only shot twice. In the public court transcripts, there is no mention of a third gunshot wound on Paula Herring. And they did put six-year-old Alan Herring on the stand. He told what he remembered about the night, and most of the questions both the prosecutor and defense asked were about his life in general. They did not play hardball with the boy. There was really no point. Finally, John Clark was called to testify in his own defense. He did admit to sleeping with Joe Herring, but denied ever laying eyes on Paula. He did remember Alan, though. In fact, the night he came over to hook up with Joe, he said he played with a little boy, that he gave him a little horseback ride on his back. He also had his gun with him at the time. He said that he took his shoulder holster with the gun off while he was at Joe Herring's house. He wasn't sure where he put it. Later, he didn't remember leaving it there and thought it had been stolen from him or that he had lost it. But the timing matches. He slept with Joe Herring the weekend before Paula's murder. It would be ten days later that he was questioned by police and said the gun was missing. He also denied he'd ever seen Al Baker the night of the murder and denied calling Joe Herring that night as well. He only saw her the one time. He had no recollection of the magic Christmas Eve bullet and stood by his entire alibi, which his schoolteacher wife supported. Don't forget this woman stood by him even though he admitted to many affairs, and she didn't divorce him while he was in prison. The couple reunited. During that short trial, the main hotel where the Nashville lawyers and reporters were staying was the New Southern Hotel. It was in that bar that Al Baker, who never could seem to keep his damn mouth shut, mentioned the magic bullet, bragging that it was the most damaging bit of evidence. You know, the bullet he suddenly remembered and called the police about when he couldn't collect on the reward money just by implicating John Clark personally. The police had needed physical evidence. 
When talking about the bullet, he slipped up and said, quote, The bullet that I fired, I mean that Clark fired on the night of the Christmas Eve party. A reporter overheard this and was so shocked he gave a sworn deposition to Galbraith. He didn't get the deposition in time for this short trial, but he did have it for appeals. Remember, Galbraith did in fact get Al Baker to admit on the stand that he had tried to buy John Clark's gun. And there's more. Charles Galbraith went hard at Joe Herring. He questioned her about her husband's death, which Hollins immediately objected to. Galbraith responded, quote, If the court please, I want to connect it up, to try to show the relationship between the two deaths. The judge sent the jury out of the room, and then Galbraith said he wanted to ask Joe about the life insurance her husband left. Specifically, who stood to profit from this girl's death? The judge asked, by her daughter's death? And Galbraith said, yes, we want to establish a motive or lack of motive. Joe Herring curtly responded that Paula was 15 years old at the time, and Alan was only two, and, quote, he left no will. Everything was mine. It's worth noting that with the insurance money, she bought that house on Timber Hill Drive just a few weeks after her husband's death. He also asked her if she knew where the gun was. She said no. He asked her if she worked for Vanderbilt Hospital at the time of the murder, and she said yes. He then asked her if she was discharged from her employment, and she denied it. He asked her if she was ever addicted to any kind of narcotic. Again, she denied it all. I think Charles Galbraith had his arm twisted in this case. He originally agreed to represent John Clark, and then the dominoes started falling. And considering he himself had slept with Joe Herring, there's no telling how much more involved he was with the powerful men who were hell-bent on covering this up. But he didn't throw softballs to Joe Herring. It would be understandable if he did. After all, she had dirt on him as well. But he didn't. He did avoid one particular clue, and that was the third gunshot wound that Paula suffered. But why? According to Michael Bishop, the first detectives on the scene were terrified that the gun used had belonged to Mayor Briley. Remember, two of the Metro detectives were part of Briley's secret drinking club, along with the district attorney and the sheriff. They would have known that Joe was sleeping with the mayor. They found the two bullets that went through Paula's back, but not the one that went into her collarbone. It's possible they thought the gun and the missing bullet could be tied to the mayor. But upon further examination of the photos, there's no exit wound for the collarbone shot. It's possible the bullet was never retrieved. Mr. Bishop found out about this when he discovered that there was no actual autopsy. Despite the photos from the morgue he had seen, there was no autopsy performed on Paula Herring. Officials explain this by saying it was clear that she had died from the gunshot wounds, but it's highly unusual that there would be no autopsy in a murder case. I also wonder what the police thought about Joe's late husband, Wilmer. You see, Joe was also the one to find her husband dead in the Noel Hotel three years earlier. His death was ruled a suicide. He had supposedly poisoned himself. It's an unusual method for a man to use. Any true crime junkie worth their salt knows that poison is a woman's weapon. Second, what are the odds that Joe Herring would discover two immediate family members dead, one by suicide and the other by murder? His family said that Joe claimed her husband left a suicide note, but she could never produce it. She claimed he was unhappy because he had lost his job but his family pointed out that he was a college graduate and had been a World War II pilot. He would have found another job. And they did not believe he was depressed, much less suicidal. Incidentally, the Noel Hotel was literally steps from Printer's Alley, the seedy alley full of corrupt cops, politicians, and hard liquor, three of Joe Herring's favorite things. In the end, none of this mattered. At 5.15, on the fifth day, as promised, the jury rendered their verdict. They found John Randolph Clark guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced him to 30 years to life. In 1974, a state appeals court judge came to a clemency hearing for Clark. That would be one Charles Galbraith. So even though he was complicit in the cover-up, he did go to battle for Clark, both at the trial and years later through appeals, on up until he finally became an appeals judge himself at which point he finally was able to do right by John Clark. 
John Clark wound up serving only nine years. In 1975, Governor Ray Blanton commuted his sentence to 25 years and released him on time served. On January 15, 1979, near the end of his term, Blanton issued pardons to 52 state prisoners, including 20 convicted murderers. Soon members of both parties and the FBI were suspicious of Blanton. Blanton was already under investigation because in 1977 he fired a woman named Marie Raggianti, chairwoman of the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, for refusing to release prisoners that she had suspected of bribing officials. She was later proven right. On December 15, 1978, the FBI raided the state capitol, seizing documents from Blanton's office. He was now officially under federal investigation. Tennessee Senate and House Speakers John Wilder and Ned McWhorter started searching for a way to stop any further damage to the state's reputation. They found a little-known fact in Tennessee state constitution that made it possible for them to swear in new governor, Lamar Alexander, three days before his actual inauguration, effectively ousting Blanton from office and severing ties publicly with both of their parties. This was later jokingly referred to as a Tennessee-style impeachment. Blanton was eventually convicted for mail fraud and extortion to sell liquor licenses, although his pay-for-pardons rulings are what he is remembered for. Why am I telling you all of this? Because the infamous babysitter killer, the one that started an urban legend, only wound up serving nine years. You would think this would have made a bigger splash. I'm sure that pretty blonde Paula Herring was forgotten in the sea of scandal that had overtaken Nashville at the time. I'm also telling you this because Michael Bishop has a witness that said John Clark paid $10,000 to get out of prison. But I ask you, did he have that kind of money? His family was wealthy, but he actually had to put up his house to secure his bond and pay Charles Galbraith. There was someone else that could pay, though. Which brings me to the letter from Mayor Beverly Briley that started Michael Bishop's investigation. Sources told Mr. Bishop that a black Cadillac had been seen in the Creve Hall area that night. Mayor Briley happened to drive one. Chief of Police Hubert Kemp had his hands tied trying to investigate Briley, but he wasn't as dumb as many high-ranking officers thought. Chief Kemp's brother lived in the Creve Hall area. The brother got his next-door neighbor to write that complaint to the mayor. The chief wanted the mayor on record about being in the area that night, even if he was not able to use it against him. I bet it really ticked him off when Joe Herring pulled that mistress card. He was an honorable policeman, honestly one of the few, considering all the scandals and convictions that later came about for Sheriff Leslie Jett and many other police officials that spring. Joe Herring was never investigated because Mayor Briley and several higher-up officials were addicts, and she knew it. She and two other nurses were their suppliers, stealing drugs from Vanderbilt. They didn't want her on trial. And she was fired from Vanderbilt for addiction after Paula's death. More importantly, Joe was not with A.J. Meadows and Billy Vanderpool that night. She was with Lizzie, but two other men one of which drove a black Cadillac, and who was also the purchasing agent for Vanderbilt Hospital. He bought the drugs, and he also reconciled the books, covering up for any shortages. There were four people who walked into the Herring home that night. There was a vicious fight. An 18-year-old girl was brutally murdered. Then two of those people, Lizzie Deverne and the purchasing agent from Vanderbilt, left the scene before the police were called. Billy Vanderpool and A.J. Meadows were recruited to cover for the real men there that night. Both were shady characters anyway. Vanderpool owned a massage parlor that fronted for a brothel. I'm sure they were easy to blackmail into covering for the other men. Lizzie was left out of the official story altogether. And why? Well, it turns out Paula Herring hated Lizzie. Just seeing her would have sparked a major fight. And Lizzie married that purchasing agent with a black Cadillac a couple of weeks after her murder. Probably because married couples are not required to testify against each other. How do we know this? Michael Bishop elicited a confession from the elderly purchasing agent from Vanderbilt about what really happened that night.
I am not using his name because Mr. Bishop used a pseudonym in his book. There are many more players in the book that I could not go into in one episode. The tangled web is too intricate for this medium, unless I spread it over several episodes. But frankly, I would not feel right basing this episode solely on his book. It's 20 years of his life's work. Instead, I chose to dig deeper into the history of Nashville's metro beginnings, its shady first mayor, and the downfall of so many high-ranking officials, from police officers all the way to the governor. Many of the witnesses in Mr. Bishop's book only spoke to him with a promise of anonymity. After over 50 years, there are still people who could be prosecuted as accessories after the fact all because the most powerful man in Nashville forced them to cover for his mistress. Michael Bishop is protecting his sources, and I don't blame him. But I do recommend that you read his book, A Murder in Music City. Every detail you could want is in there, albeit with a few names changed. I'm going to leave you with this. Wilmer Herring's family revealed that Eva Jo Ainsworth was brought up in a family brothel in Texas. Her father had pimped out his own wife, her mother, and that basically, Jo was raised learning to use sex for power. Jo Herring also bought two grave plots hours after Paula's murder. She wound up moving back to Texas with Alan and was later buried next to her husband, Wilmer. She left Paula in a lonely grave in Tennessee, with the empty plot still beside her. So why the two grave plots? Paula Herring was coming into her own. She was making choices, developing a strong personality with clear goals for her future. She wanted to be a lawyer. Maybe she was ready to expose her mother for what she was. When author Michael Bishop set out to investigate this cover-up, he contacted Alan Herring. Alan said he only had two questions. Where was his father's suicide note, and why wasn't he killed too? I think the answer is simple. There was no suicide note. And Paula's murder was messy. It did not go as planned. So Joe Herring called in the most powerful man she knew, the mayor of Nashville, to clean up her mess. But the cover-up was also messy. There were too many loose ends. If Alan Herring had been killed after Paula's murder, Joe would have been caught. It was too late. So she cut her losses and left town. Back in Texas, she died suddenly at the age of 52. Chronic alcoholism and drug use were likely the cause of the heart attack that killed her. Mayor Briley died five years after leaving office at the age of 66. They both died thinking their secrets had gone to the grave with them. And without Michael Bishop's incredible expose, I'm sure they would have. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. As always, if you enjoyed the show, tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on Stitcher and many other apps. If you're interested in supporting the show, come check out my Patreon page or visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com. And please, go support Michael Bishop's incredible book, A Murder in Music City, Corruption, Scandal, and the Framing of an Innocent Man. Thank you so much, Mike. This was a hell of a ride. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys, and I'm always looking for new cases, so please feel free to reach out. I'm all over social media. Just search the show name in your favorite platform if you'd like to connect with me there. If you're interested in discussing this crazy case or any other episodes further, come check out my discussion group. It is linked to my main Facebook page. I would love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.